Hello, uh, good afternoon uh, here in Europe. Uh, welcome everybody to this new uh, installment of the second series of this mixed gen events. Uh, today, the topic will be on simulating uh, glasses. And it's a pleasure to have with us uh, Ludovic Bartier from University Montpellier, Grace Sommers from Princeton University, and Chenjie Luo from the University of Technology of Indoor. Um, this uh, series is a series that started during the pandemic, but uh, it has been quite well received. So we keep it on going with the idea to bring uh, young researchers, PhDs and postdocs uh, in contact to also to be able to, to, uh, to get in contact with more experienced researchers and to share their work. And we always organize these uh, events in two, these afternoons uh, in two parts. Uh, first uh, part of it that takes place here in Zoom where we have these presentations, uh, one by a more experienced researcher, Ludovic today, and two younger uh, uh, members of the community. Uh, and then there is a second part where we will meet and gather and then where there will be other people, other attendees that are presenting their works in, in, uh, through posters. And the idea there is that there is a, a room, an environment where you can more interactively and informally uh, talk to each other and for the presenters to have the opportunity to present their results and then also uh, to discuss with uh, the rest of, of the attendees. So I hope that uh, you also find today's sessions, uh, today's session um, attractive. And just before we really start uh, with it, as usual, a small, a couple of, uh, a small presentation with uh, some technical information, since we have to interact remotely, just to, to make it uh, clear. Uh, first of all, this session, the event will be recorded. Actually, all the mixed gen uh, events are recorded, and then they are later available on the CCAM YouTube channel. So actually, you can visit the YouTube channel directly or through our CCAM website if you also want to, to see uh, previous sessions where we touch uh, the role of computer simulations uh, modeling in, in different areas of the different topics uh, that are uh, sort of relevant for, for CCAM. And, and then in this first part for, with the presentations, um, but you, you, can, you cannot activate your video or you cannot activate uh, on, uh, you, you cannot decide to activate the sound, uh, which then means that all the interaction that, you, that we will have is through the Q&A channel. In this way we uh, focus it and it's clear how we interact. Now for, for the, the, at CCAM, you know that we always uh, aim at generating an environment where we can interact as much as possible and exchange our views and our thoughts. And also we try to do that here in this session. So the idea is that uh, for in the first presentation by, by Ludovic Bartier, which is a bit longer, that you can ask questions during the talk if there are points that you want to raise or clarify. Uh, during, this pre during his presentation, the way in which you can ask a question is by writing the question in the Q&A channel. And then I will take care of uh, relaying it to uh, the speaker. When Ludovic finishes the presentation, then there will be an extended uh, time for a Q&A, for questions and answers. Uh, in that part of the session, then you do not have to write the question. Again, in the same channel Q&A, you can simply indicate that you want to ask the question or you can use the, the hand symbol. Uh, and then I will, uh, so we will, uh, give you the possibility to unmute. So then you unmute yourself when I tell you, and then you can ask the question. I think that also gives the possibility to have a more direct uh, in interaction. And if there is a question that is uh, rich enough, it allows also to have a, a dialogue with the, with the speaker, which I think it's also uh, more attractive and interesting and insightful for everybody. Now, for the other two talks, the, the talk by, by Grace and Cheng, Chengjie, because they are shorter, uh, I will not take questions while they are doing the presentation. There will be the Q&A part that will work in the same way as I was telling you, where then you simply indicate you want to ask the question and then you can do that lively and hopefully then also enforce this, this lively environment 
uh, around or following each of the talks. Um, so that's that's uh, the technicality of how we are going to interact during the, the coming two hours. And also, uh, let me just uh, announce or advertise two additional events. As I said, this, this mixed gen uh, is, uh, we, we organize once uh, every, every month. So the next one will be at the end of March. It's always at the end of the month. Uh, then uh, this will be about simulating biological systems. The experienced uh, speaker will be Benoit Roux from the University of Chicago. And as usual, uh, when we receive the proposals for posters from the younger, uh, the, the younger uh, researchers, then we will select two additional speakers. So you can keep uh, checking in our website. We also announce by email and on Twitter. You can also follow us on Twitter, for example, then you will get that information. And also, uh, besides the mixed gen series, we also organize uh, with uh, uh, less periodic, I mean, less frequently, but also periodically, uh, the Marianne Mansat conversation series that uh, where we aim to, to discuss also informally uh, what are the aspects in which uh, computation and modeling uh, has a more scientific or societal impact. And the, the next uh, invited speaker will be Eric Wimmer, and the session will take place at the beginning of May, the 5th of May. And, uh, and then again, here we record them, so you can also, if you want to check the type of uh, speakers that we have had and how these Marian Mensah conversations evolve, you can also uh, visit us in our, uh, in our uh, website. So I finish here this short presentation, and now we move on to the actual content of, of today's about simulating glasses. So it's a pleasure now to give the, the floor to Ludovic Vertier from University of Montpellier. Uh, for this first uh, lecture. So please do the big. Um, okay, can you hear me? I'm not sure, Ignacio. Yes, yeah, 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 we can hear you. Everything is fine. Okay, so let me then uh, start the talks. I'm checking the time for my watch. Uh, so thank you, Ignacio, for the introduction and, of course, the CCAM for organizing uh, this series. So you said we are going to continue this after the pandemic. So I'm not sure the pandemic is yet uh, over because I tested uh, positive a few days ago. So preparation of the talk hasn't been uh, easy for me. Uh, so thank you. Anyway, I'm very glad to give this presentation. So I'm trying to... Uh, uh, try and discuss the physics of uh, glass transition studies from the viewpoint of uh, computer simulations. So that was the, uh, the task I was assigned, assigned to for this uh, presentation. So two main messages I would like to convey. First, the idea that over the last few years, quite some progress has been done in order to understand and simulate systems uh, approaching a glass transition and understanding the physics of those uh, glassy materials. And also, as the title indicates, I'm going to try and give you perspectives for what, in my view, are the next interesting questions that can be studied in the coming year. So I'll try to give uh, as many perspectives as I can uh, on this topic uh, as we go. So I will be uh, relatively uh, generic, not entering too much into the details to give you uh, an overview of different topics and problems. But of course, we have a lot of time in the question and answer sessions and later in the gather, I'll be happy to discuss and take more detailed questions and uh, discuss in more details. So I would like to first acknowledge many of the people who have uh, contributed to the results I'm going to show um, uh, later in this presentation. And all this work has been done in the context of these uh, larger uh, collaborations funded by uh, Simons over the last few years that has been extremely uh, useful uh, for the work I'm going to present. So first I'm going to give you the broad introduction about the physical problem itself of glassy systems, systems undergoing a glass transition. 
So the broad motivation is that systems undergoing a glass transitions are found in a lot of contexts in physics. I will be discussing mainly simple liquids and simple models for the glass transitions, but I have worked a lot on systems that are a bit more complicated than these simple liquids, such as uh, say dense assemblies of colloidal particles which undergo glass transitions. And more recently, the systems composed of uh, active particles, active cellular materials that also display interesting uh, glassy phenomena. And in this work on dense assemblies of animals, again, glassy physics is at play just to convey the message that the problem of the glass transition, it's on the one hand, a very fundamental problem for statistical physics, for disordered materials in general, with many, many applications everywhere in soft condensed matter, for instance, living matter, biophysics, and even uh, computer science. So I said, I'm going to, to uh, discuss mainly the physics of simple liquids. So what is the glass transition in very simple materials undergoing the glass transition? And glasses in the sense are simply formed by cooling a liquid. And that's the, the main figure that we show in all the talks about the glass transition. So if you follow something like the volume of your system as a function of the temperature, you take, you start from the liquid state. And if you cool the system relatively, the system is too simple, you're going to crystallize. And this is the uh, well-known uh, transition between the liquid and the crystal. In the rest of the talk, I won't talk about the crystal at all. So please don't uh, ask me questions about the crystal. I'm going to talk about systems for which it's relatively easy and straightforward to super cool the transition towards the crystal and can access very easily this super cool liquid state. And this is what is going to be the main topic of uh, today, forgetting forever about the crystalline state from now on. So what's happening as you decrease further the temperature of this super cool liquid? So many things are well known. The viscosity of the liquid grows uh, dramatically. The relaxation time, the time it takes for the molecules to move in the liquid grows also dramatically. So uh, fast that when you reach the glass transition, it takes so much time for the particles to relax that they don't relax anymore and you enter the glassy state below Tg. So the way I described it then Tg is just set by the competition between how fast you cool your system and how fast the particles are moving into the liquid. And that's the basic empirical experimental definition of this glass transition temperature here. Again, by this very description, it means that the glass that you obtain at low T has simply retained the structure of the liquid that has been frozen at Tg. And you can, from this very simple diagram, ask very many questions. So questions about the crystal that I'm not going to address. Questions related to the physics of this super cool liquid. What's the dynamics of this system? How much is the structure changing? What's the physical properties of the glassy material that you access below Tg? What are the very low temperature properties of the glass? What kind of phase transition may explain or not explain the transition between the liquid and the glass? And these are all the broad interesting questions that we'd like to address using computer simulations. So two key, uh, two sorts of questions that we are asking. So what about thermodynamic properties of the liquid state and this liquid to glass transition? And it's been known for many decades since at least the work of Kautzmann 70 years ago that some quantity display interesting temperature dependencies as you approach the glass transition. So at the time of Kautzmann, this quantity, the configurational entropy was called probably the excess entropy. So let me call it the configurational entropy for today. And the way Kautzmann estimated it at the time was by subtracting from the, the entropy of the liquid, the entropy of the crystalline state at the same temperature. And he called this the excess entropy. So the entropy that the liquid has in excess to the crystal. And then he rescaled the data for many different liquids in this type of plot and observed that for many different liquids, this configurational entropy decreases steeply as the system approaches this experimental glass transition. And Kautzmann noticed that if you extrapolate this curve to even lower temperatures where the data are no longer available, then there is a hint that something funny is going to happen, the point where 
the entropy of the totally disordered system in the liquid would be as low as the entropy of the completely ordered system in the crystal, which is a hint that something funny is happening in the structure and the thermodynamics of the supercool liquid. If you could access this very low temperature that we now call the Kautzmann temperature TK. And that was the hint that something like a thermodynamic phase transition between an equilibrium liquid and an equilibrium glassy phase could perhaps take place at this temperature. So the very broad question that many people in this uh, area are trying to answer is, does something like a thermodynamic phase transition underlie the formation of uh, glasses? So that's a broad question that I'm going to develop in the future. A second series of interesting questions relates to the dynamical behavior of these liquids approaching the glass transition. So if you look at how slow the molecules move in the liquid, well, I told you that the dynamic was so slow that below TG, you cannot be in equilibrium anymore and you cannot ergodically explore the configuration space below TG. And this graph is showing you how slow the molecules are moving in different types of liquids. So these data are taken from dielectric, measure, dielectric susceptibility measurements. So you see here that you have something like 14, 16 orders of magnitude. And if you look carefully at the, um, the uh, functional form of this, so this is the log of tau versus one over t. So for high temperature, the dynamics is fast. It's in the picosecond 10 to the minus 10 second range and the temperature dependence is something like Arrhenius. And then below this roughly defined outside temperature, you see that the relaxation time increases much more strongly with decreasing temperature up to the experimental glass transition where the relaxation time now falls into the say 10 to the two second is a, a rough number that I'm going to use very often. So you see this dramatic change in the dynamical properties. So whereas the typical time scale for one molecule to relax is in the picosecond, 10 to the minus 10 seconds in, at high temperature. It's uh, hundreds of seconds at the experimental gas transition. So from the viewpoint of exploring configuration space, uh, this is bad. So slow dynamics, in a sense, is a burden. It's so slow that the system cannot really equilibrate anymore. And so we, cannot difficult, we have difficulties to summarize those systems. But on the other hand, of course, obviously, this is also fascinating physics problems because we must understand and explain or address the question as how these molecules move so slowly close to the experimental glass transition. And it's an interesting physics problem in itself. So these are the very broad questions I wanted to ask. So what about approaching the, this problem from the point of view of statistical physics? What are the tools? What are the key quantities? What are the types of phase transitions that could explain this uh, formation of classes? And over the last uh, decades or so, uh, it has become clear that something like a mean field theory of the glass transition can be, uh, uh, has been uh, constructed and is now on very solid ground. So the story is a bit long and complex. It lasted maybe 30 years, but now is the time maybe to uh, take a step back and decide that this is really uh, what this mean field theory of the glass transition looks like. So there is a book that was published already two years ago that summarizes this long and complex history and it's called theory of simple glasses. So how does the mean field theory of the glass transition looks like? So first of all, how is it constructed? Well, it was first derived from observing that in simple models of disordered systems, something like uh, a transition like uh, was observed or imagined by Kosman was being um, uh, at play in these spin glass models. And more recently, I think uh, what was the key development is this progress that has been made in order to understand the statistical me mechanics of simple liquids in the limit of large dimensions and in particular of their glass transition. And in this limit of large dimensions, the statistical mechanics of these dense liquids gives a very precise answer for what the glass transition looks like. And within mean field, there is a thermodynamic glass transition, which is indeed exactly realized as Kautzmann had uh, imagined. It has the flavor of a first order transition and it has thus uh, a discontinuous order parameter attached to it. 
And this other parameter, it's the overlap Q that I'm going to define in a minute. So it's not defined by some particular change in the density profiles that you would have for the crystal. It's a change in the fluctuations of this quantity, the overlap, which is defined from uh, taking two equilibrium configurations of my system. So I've shown you in this cartoon, a blue and a red uh, configuration of my liquid, say. And the overlap Q defined between these two configurations is the degree of similarity between the density profiles of these two configurations. So this is one mathematical definition of an overlap, which is defined such a way that if the blue and the red configuration essentially have the same density profiles in space, the overlap will be close to one as on the right uh, cartoon here. On the other hand, if the two configurations that are drawn from my equilibrium states are very different, then the overlap will be close to zero. And so an overlap going from zero to one or to a large value discontinuously is what's going to happen in the mean field theory of the glass transition. So now that we have another parameter, it's possible to re-express uh, this theory as you would do for any kind of uh, phase transition that you've learned in statistical physics by expressing the free energy of the system as a function of the other parameter, as we always do when we do Landau descriptions of phase transitions. And in the context of the class transition, the uh, Landau free energy has the name it has been called the Franz Parisi potential and introduced 25 years ago. So V of Q is really the free energy cost to have a value Q of uh, the overlap that I've defined before. So in the limit of mean field, this free energy can be expressed and computed as is uh, shown on this graph. And without knowing what it's about, this is the free energy versus the order parameter, the overlap. It has this uh, flavor of a first order transition, as I said before, meaning that just above the glass transition, as for the red temperature here, above the Kaltzmann transition, the liquid is the equilibrium state and the glass is the metastable uh, phase that's going to become the equilibrium phase at lower temperature when the two phases have the same free energy. So if I just look at the minimum of the free energy, the liquid has uh, zero uh, average overlap. And when the temperature is going to approach the Kautzmann transition, the overlap is going to jump discontinuously to the glass phase here. So I mean, the average overlap is zero in the liquid and it jumps discontinuously and it's finite in the glass phase below TK. So that's what's happening for the order parameter for the free energy. Then there is an interesting quantity, which is the free energy difference between the liquid and the glass. When the glass is metastable in the liquid uh, phase, and it turns out that this quantity is directly related, and this can be understood precisely in the context of the theory, to the configurational entropy that I mentioned before. So as you approach the glass transition, this configurational entropy is going to vanish discontinu uh, sorry, continuously because the free energy difference between the liquid and the glass is going to be uh, vanishing at the Kautzmann transition. So this is in a nutshell what the mean field theory of the glass transition looks like at the static thermodynamic level uh, from the viewpoint of this mean field theory. So, so this is uh, what you see. So one uh, interesting consequence that I'm going to explore later is it's possible to think not only in terms of the uh, overlap, but in terms of a field that could be thermodynamically conjugate to the overlap. So instead of using Q, I could use epsilon, which I define just like this by saying epsilon is the field thermodynamically conjugate to the uh, overlap. So in terms of what epsilon means, it's a bit complicated. So epsilon is a field that favors large values of the overlap. So we can think about it as being like an attractive field, which is coupling my liquid to a reference configuration, a second reference configuration of the liquid, trying to favor large values of the overlap here. So what it's doing, interestingly, it means if I consider the liquid and I increase the value of this field epsilon, trying to favor large values of Q, I'm going to tilt this uh, free energy. I'm going to favor the glassy phase as compared to the liquid phase. 
And what I'm going to do, I'm going to induce a first order phase transition, which would exist then at temperatures above these equilibrium uh, glass transition temperatures. So what it does, and this is why it's interesting for us, that instead of just looking at the temperature axis here, if I extend the phase diagram with this epsilon uh, field here, the fact that the configurational entropy vanishes, that the glass is metastable with respect to the liquid, it's giving me for free this equilibrium uh, first order transition line in blue here, which ends at the second order critical point here. And so it means the physics that is maybe difficult to see or hint directly in this epsilon equals to zero axis. It's giving rise to interesting signatures in this extended phase diagram that I'm going to explore in the simulations uh, later. So final bit that comes from understanding the physics of the thermodynamics and the static uh, properties of this uh, mean field theory of the glass transition is it's what it's, it's, it's helping us thinking about the real space and the structure of the glasses. So we all know that if you look at snapshots of a very fast flowing liquid and a very slow flowing liquid, it's very difficult by the eye to tell the difference which is simply saying that if you want to quantify the structural changes between the high temperature and the low temperature system approaching the glass transition, it's been known forever that it's not captured by two point density correlation functions that vary very little as you decrease the temperature. But the uh, theory and these considerations about the um, overlap and the configurational entropy in the free energy landscape tell us it's telling us that the decrease of the configurational entropy is implying that some kind of multi-point correlation functions that, and in particular, uh, correlation length that has been called a point to set correlation length is growing as the system is uh, approaching the glass transition. And since the work of, uh, at least this work by Biroli and Bouchard, the, the, the relationship between the spatial correlations and the configurational entropy is that they are inversely proportional. So growth of configurational entropy implies directly the growth of multiplying correlation functions. And that has been an important theme in the uh, theories of the class transition. So- Sorry, sorry, uh, uh, Louis, before you follow yeah. on, there is a question about the nature of the overlap by Patrick Keel. He says, for lattice, for example, the spin systems, the overlap is well defined. For off lattice systems, shouldn't we account for translations and rotations, which seems to make the quantity hard to deal with? Uh, yes, it's in principle. Uh, we should. Uh, I, I can explain maybe uh, later to you, Patrick, why it's not important. You're right. We should subtract the translations and rotations. It turns out that. In many of the computational study and the practicalities that we do, we, 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 we take care of these translations and rotations for free. I, I can explain later, uh, not during the talk, but in the QA if you want to come back with it. It's taken care of. Okay. Uh, summary and the theoretical simulation so, uh, situation. So, so what did I tell you? I tell you that if we work in the limit of large dimensions, everything is understood and very clear. The nature of the transition, the nature of the order parameter, the nature of what are the important thermodynamic fluctuations, the relevant correlations, the relevant length scales, it's all understood, okay? So that's first point. Of course, what's not well understood is how is this construction going to apply in finite d? What are what is the influence of the finite d fluctuations? Do they simply modify and how, or do they completely destroy that picture? And this is where, of course, uh, the hard work remains to be done. I haven't said much about the dynamics so far from the point of view of this mean field theory. It's because treatment of the dynamics is much more difficult, and I think. Uh, much less advanced, and it's an interesting, difficult problem. So because it's difficult to handle these finite D fluctuations, you all know that there are many other models of physical ideas or intuitions or scenarios for the glass transitions that have been put forward. And of course, they may play a role, they may be interesting, and they may complete the picture or replace the mean field picture in finite dimensions. So to understand these combined effects of finite fluctuations, what's the dynamics doing? 
And are there other physical ingredients that are important? Of course, one must do clearly direct studies in two and three dimensions. And this is crucial. And this is where computer simulations are really, really playing an important role. So that comes to my main point, which is how do we simulate liquids and glasses, which was the task I was again uh, given to for today. So we do typically computer simulations of the simplest models we can think of because we want to say understand the universal behaviors related to the glass transition. So we take simple fluids to, in order to prevent crystallization, we make them fully dispersed, a discrete or continuous size polydispersity, for instance. And then that's it. We use molecular dynamics. We want to study atoms and molecules or Brownian dynamics sometimes to study colloidal physics. So you discretize and integrate the equations of motion. Uh, I'm using a lot simple Monte Carlo simulations where you take one particle, you try to move them at random, then you apply the Metropolis filter to maintain detail balance and you repeat this uh, over and over again. That's a way to, in a sense, not integrating the equations of motion, doing something else. And again, you get access to uh, equilibrium configurations by uh, construction. One result that we obtained long ago is that if you look at the dynamics using Monte Carlo simulations performed this way by uh, simply random small displacements, it's a non-trivial result, but it, it's found that the long-time dynamics is strictly equivalent to, to doing molecular dynamics. So it's not completely trivial. I mean, it requires some thinking about it. So it's cool because it means you can use Monte Carlo simulations to do and understand glassy dynamics. But in terms of efficiently simulating glasses, you gain nothing because Monte Carlo then, because they're identical to MD, they essentially gain nothing. Okay, so they are strictly equivalent in sense in terms of the physics and the efficiency, how fast uh, they work. So how fast do simulations work? So I have these slides that I like to show. So this is one of the earliest papers I know where uh, 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 computer simulations were used to study uh, glassy physics. So that goes back to the work of uh, Jean-Pierre Hansen and co-workers. And at the time they were looking at this uh, binary subsystem system and the excess axis is made of three orders of magnitude here. So we have all read this paper by Walter Kerm and Hans Andersen where they devised this binary Lennardron system and you see that the uh, X axis has increased to six to seven orders of magnitude of uh, time scale using molecular dynamics. And this is a more recent paper where at the time I was using Monte Carlo simulations of heart sphere 2009. And you see that the time axis now is nine orders of magnitude. But in terms of uh, what kind of glassy physics can you get? Of course, if you go to the dilute system, dynamics is super fast, but it's boring. So really interesting physics starts roughly when the relaxation time in Monte Carlo unit is something like 10 to the three. And of course, at the end, it's, it's really, I'm not totally sure that this one is well thermalized, but the relaxation time for this guy is about 10 to the eight, despite the nine orders of magnitude. So it means I've been able some, to simulate something like five interesting orders of magnitude for the growth of the uh, relaxation time of the system. So if you want to make a dictionary in terms of uh, molecular time scale that I gave you before, so the onset, uh, when the physics gets started is 10 to the minus 10 picoseconds, I told you, so five decades take you to 10 microseconds roughly. So this is typically uh, what you can do by pushing these Monte Carlo simulations over nine uh, orders of magnitude in terms of time scale. Okay, so can one do better and invent smart Monte Carlo things in order to speed up and get uh, better access to low temperature configurations? So that has been tried a lot, I would say. So parallel tempering has been used more recently, population annealing has been used, Wang Landau things to explore configuration space beta. These event chain Monte Carlo simulations have been used. And it, in each of the cases, I think the gain is relatively modest, a factor of 10 to 100, maybe. 
And so the, uh, of course, the, the uh, Monte Carlo algorithm that I'm going to describe now is the one that works uh, much better. And the uh, algorithm is called a swap, a swap Monte Carlo algorithm. And so it, it's, it's a small variation of the Monte Carlo algorithm I, I told you before. So with a small probability, we do the same small translational moves I told you about. And the other types of move that one does is we pick two particles and we try to swap their identity. Again, Metropolis filter, ta, 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 equilibrium is fine. And this is what uh, Gregor and Parisi had uh, invented uh, 20 years ago now. So for some time, it wasn't clear that this method would be uh, very efficient, but it has become clear that if you think a little bit about the type of model where you can uh, use and apply the swap, then swap Monte Carlo algorithm is able indeed to provide a very big speed up in the dynamics. And that's illustrated in this uh, plot here. So I'm showing you here the relaxation time of the system. So the blue data are really this uh, physical dynamics. So these are the five orders of magnitude that you can uh, simulate brute force by uh, following the dynamics of your system in the computer simulations. So you are short of the 12 orders of magnitude that are needed to access the experimental gas transition TG. However, if you implement this swap Monte Carlo moves that I've told you about before, you see that the relaxation time at this temperature remains uh, almost uh, microscopic. At the exp estimated experimental gas transition, the relaxation time is still uh, easily uh, beaten by the time that you have in your simulations. And so you can push the simulations below the experimental gas transition and maintain some dynamic equilibrium for some time. So the type of speed up that you gain by this uh, swap Monte Carlo algorithm is a factor of at least 10 to the 10 at the glass transition and much more below the glass transition. And we found that in two dimensions, the speed up is uh, even uh, much, much larger. So it's giving us a way to really extremely quickly reach thermal equilibrium at extremely low temperatures. So that's what the swap uh, is doing us. So that was already uh, five years ago. So in the meantime, quite a bit of developments have been done to push the swap Monte Carlo in order to make it work in different types of special dimensions to explore the physics of uh, say, uh, dimensionality. We've uh, tried to make it closer to molecular dynamics by making a hybrid molecular dynamics Monte Carlo version of the code and efficiency is just the same. We've tried to push towards uh, the types of system that had been developed before, like this carbon descent like uh, system. And for the carbon descent binary mixture as defined by carbon descent many years ago, the particles are so dissimilar in the mixture that it's really impossible to swap like the A to the B particles because the swap moves are always rejected. So what we've done in this work, we've generalized the carbon descent model to say ternary or even larger uh, types of uh, polydispersity. And if you take a, a, even a simple ternary generalization of the carbon descent parameters, you introduce a C particle in between the A and the B, and then you can swap the B and the C and the C and the A, and then the system is really uh, relaxing much uh, faster using the swap uh, algorithm. So it means after this work, we have you know, a good num numerical representation of the model for metallic glasses where the swap is efficient. So I've tried to be relatively quick on this story. So that's the computational aspect of the thing. So what are the perspectives there? So one question that is very interesting to me is, well, can we already extend the swap Monte Carlo to more complicated or more, you would say, realistic systems? So can we do more realistic metallic glasses? Can we do polymer glasses? And can we do even uh, something like uh, molecular systems? And of course, because swap is working, I mean, it's, it's so efficient and the speed up is so dramatic. We are becoming greedy. I mean, can we find even better algorithm than swap Monte Carlo? I mean, if, if we can do swap and it's so simple, how can we make it a bit more complicated combined with different types of Monte Carlo or something and get uh, 
even better algorithms. I think it's a totally open and very interesting question. For me. So that was the uh, part about uh, how to simulate these liquids and in glasses. And we have um, discussed the idea that the swap is allowing us to get to very low temperatures relatively quickly. So what can we do with it? We can do new things, simulating thermodynamic properties in relation to what I told you in the uh, StatMec chapter introduction of this talk. So what can we do in terms of using the swap Monte Carlo algorithm to push and probe these thermodynamic fluctuations of the glass of systems approaching the glass transition. So just a few key slides. So this one is a bit busy, but I'll take some time to describe. So I told you that the key quantity coming and being defined from the mean filter of the glass transition was this Landau free energy description of the glass transition. So remember, uh, I showed you this cartoon of um, free energy with two uh, minima. So can we try and measure this very key core quantity in computer simulations in finite dimensions? And the answer is uh, yes. So in, this is a free energy measurement. So you have to learn how to measure free energies from uh, computer simulations. And so you open your textbooks. And then you realize that the free energy is directly related to fluctuations of your order parameter. So really the quantity you have to quantify is uh, compute the probability distribution function of your order parameter, the overlap in that case. You take the log, KBT divided by N, and then you get your free energy, which is the quantity I'd like to be measuring here. So it's not an easy quantity to measure, but it's doable. So we've worked quite some years to get there, to get uh, these probability distribution functions with the good statistics into the tiles. You have to do bias simulations, such as umbrella sampling. Of course, you do bias simulations at low temperatures in a disordered system. So equilibration is very difficult. So you have to fight this. You have to make sure that everything's done in equilibrium. There is an disorder average to be done. So you have to multiply your simulations by hundreds of samples, et cetera, et cetera. This is AV, but this is doable and it's been done. And this is the results that have been obtained by uh, Benjamin Gislin during uh, his PhD uh, in Montpellier. So this is direct measurement of this free, lambda of free energy, this Franz Parisi potential for a three-dimensional system and on the right for a two-dimensional system. And uh, uh, the type of model studied here is a polydispersed uh, subsphere model, very much like the one that uh, Jean-Pierre Hansen and co-workers had used uh, many years ago. So what we realize is that as we decrease the temperature, we see the development and uh, of this uh, broad tail in this uh, lambda of free energy, a large value of the overlap just as was expected from the mean field behavior I showed you before. So we are no longer in mean field, we're in finite dimensions where free energies are no longer allowed to be non-convex. And so the non-convexity that we see in the simulations here are finite size effects that are going to disappear in the large N limit. So convexity is restored in the finite dimensions. So the key thing that we see here, we see the development of this tail at large Q, the development of, if you wish, the emergence of a metastable glass state as we approach the Kalsman transition. So these uh, free energy uh, curves that Benjamin has measured, you can take them if you wish as the signature of this uh, incipient first order transition that is about to happen at the Kaltzman transition uh, at lower temperature. The cool thing with the Landau free energy that I'm going, to, I'm showing you here is it's observed in fully equilibrium conditions. I haven't extrapolated anything when I told you this. So maybe you're not yet convinced that we are approaching a first order transition. So I'm going to push that button a little more. So remember I told you that the free energy difference between the liquid at low Q and the glass at large Q was in the context of the mean field theory directly related to the configurational entropy. So if I take this, 
Sorry, uh, little bit before we move on, because there are two questions. One is actually very directly related to the previous uh, graph, yeah, but also by Patrick uh, sa saying, uh, shouldn't the minimum of V of Q be at Q zero at high temperatures? Um, now, if you type two random density patterns and you try to compute the Q function that I defined mathematically with this um, superposition of Gaussian, you have a random probability that two particles are going to be at the same location. And this is what's giving you this small uh, Q value here. So you can compute that guy uh, exactly. So it's small, but it's, it's final. Okay. And the other is more about the method and it kind of goes a little bit uh, back to when you presented different algorithms. It's by Benedict Plaque, And he says, how do the pocket Monte Carlo algorithms of Bernard Krauf it all fit into the picture. If I recall correctly, they were able to show the absence of thermodynamic transitions at zero temperature as a function of density in certain hard sphere systems. Are these models somehow special? Do these methods generalize to finite temperatures? Well, I, I can, we can again uh, talk a bit uh, later. Yeah. They mm -hmm. haven't showed what you say. I mean, uh, the, I know that many people believe uh, this is what's in this uh, Werner Kraut paper. They haven't disproved this. Uh, I mean, this claim is totally wrong. So okay. the uh, event chain algorithm that Kraut is using at the time is much, much less efficient than the swap. So we can do much better now. And even if you look carefully at what this paper actually achieves, the one that you mentioned, Benedict, it doesn't achieve what you say, but I can explain later. Yeah, thank you again. I, I'm relaying the questions, but indeed, uh, Benedict, uh, if you want to come back to this, uh, we can go deeper during the Q&A session. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ignacio. Uh, okay, so I said, uh, okay, I wanted to uh, think about this free energy difference and using this to being my new estimate for the configurational entropy at this, again, this free energy difference between the liquid and the glass. So what I've done here, I've collected in gray the data that I've shown you before in the uh, plot that Kautzmann had done 70 years ago. And what I'm adding on top of this are these uh, computer simulations that we can now do at very low temperatures, thanks to the swap Monte Carlo algorithm. So the red and the purple or whatever pink and the blue things are three dimensional uh, models for super cool liquid. This one, by the way, is a hard sphere system that close to what the crowd paper was uh, doing many years ago. So in these three models, what we have done, we have estimated the configuration that entropy. So first of all, you see that the trend that the, the experimental people had discovered 70 years ago is fully confined by the simulations that we can now do at low temperatures in three-dimensional uh, simple glass systems. And if we try and think about how these systems extrapolate to low temperature, and we use the same idea of Kautzmann of pushing these extrapolations to low T, we again have the feeling that they approach something like a phase transition at some finite temperature uh, TK. So there is one system which is different, which is the green system here, and that system is computer simulations of a soft sphere and hard sphere system that we've done in two dimensional uh, glaciers. And if we extrapolate this guy and we try to decide where the Kautzmann transition would be for those two dimensional systems, it seems that the Kautzmann transition for this system is very close to zero. So D equals two seems to be uh, behaving very differently from uh, uh, larger dimensions in that plot. Okay. And I told you before about this uh, extended phase diagram by introducing this field epsilon conjugate to the uh, volat. So Benjamin Gisler again has studied uh, these two dimensional and three dimensional systems in this extended phase diagram. So what does he find? So if we look for phase transition in these epsilon T phase diagrams, we don't find any. What we find is a line which we would call a widom line, a line where the fluctuations are large but we don't find any kind of phase transitions down to extremely low temperatures below the exponential glass transition. So it seems that even in the extended phase diagram, we find no kind of phase transition. If we go to three dimensions instead, so I, I showed you what was happening as we decreased the temperature for 
the lambda of free energy and for the configurational entropy. We put the field epsilon and what do we find? Well, we find very strong, well, relatively good, strong evidence from the computational viewpoint that something like a critical point exists, this yellow box here, and we look carefully at the uh, critical fluctuations surrounding this point. And we have a good understanding of what they do. And if we go below this critical point, we have good, again, uh, idea that something like a line of first order transition exists. So the idea we have for how these systems behave that in two dimensions, there is nothing happening down to zero temperature, no phase transition in the epsilon T plane. But in three dimensions, we have the feeling that we have good evidence for something happening at TK, a line of first order transitions ending at the second order critical point here. So this is where we are in terms of measuring the thermodynamics. Many questions, can we get closer to TK and can we get and understand better special uh, fluctuations related to the, the thermodynamic fluctuations. So I'm not sure how I'm doing in terms of the time because I haven't checked the time when I'm started. Uh, Ignacio, uh, you, you still have uh, seven more minutes. Uh, seven so more minutes. Then we move to the okay, yeah. okay. So I, I want at least to say something about uh, the dynamics. I've told you how we get uh, from the simulations a good idea that you know, the whole construct of the mean filter is observed. So what can we say and do about the dynamic behavior now? So what can we do with the swap? Does the swap help doing equilibrium dynamics at OT? Well, it helps in a sense because we can extremely quickly prepare equilibrium configurations at any temperature we like. But of course, if we want to observe the physical dynamics, we have to do it without the swap moves, which is then as slow as ever, as slow as before. So what can we do with it? Well, this is what we can do. We can start with uh, uh, systems that, as I said, are in equilibrium, and then we can watch for as long as we can, and we can then record what the dynamics looks like. So if we, if we push the simulations quite a bit using say, many CPUs for quite some time, say a few weeks, and we have reasonable system sizes, we, we can achieve something like 10 to the 10 uh, steps in the uh, MD simulations if we wish. So if we translate this in terms of experimental time scale, it's something like 30 milliseconds, okay? So what does it mean in terms of experimental observations? So it means that if we want to follow the systems up to its structural relaxation, it means we can, follow the structural relaxations about something like eight orders of magnitude. And it means we can roughly be in between what we were doing before where we had only four or five or interesting decades. And of course the 12 that would be needed to go to the experimental gas transition. So in terms of, you know, how, how can we go in terms of the increase of the relaxation time, we can access times that are not yet at the glass transition, but uh, much closer than before. In terms of following the equilibrium dynamics, we can, of course, study systems that are equilibrated at the experimental glass transition, and we can then follow certain milliseconds of their equilibrium dynamics. So in terms of you know, observing uh, the relaxation of the system, so we can observe anything that happens at frequencies that are larger than, say, 10 to the 3 uh, hertz here. So in particular, even for these low temperature systems, we can have access at you know, the relatively short time dynamics as compared to the uh, structural relaxation. But in particular, we can access this regime that uh, people in experiments have called the excess ring regime where something like this power law behavior uh, is observed. So I'm going to show you two snapshots of what we can do. I told you we can do and observe the entire relaxation dynamics over 30 milliseconds for systems that are as low as we can. And this is what we observe when we look at the relaxation dynamics in real space. So these images are such that the red particles have relaxed and the blue particles have not yet relaxed. So we see how the dynamics proceeds from extremely early times here, and then we go logarithmically in times up to the uh, relaxation time of the system where, where a large fraction of the system has already relaxed. So we have many, a lot of information in these images we have the growth of these red domains that we see. We have these very localized regions that emerges at extremely early times. 
We have interesting length scales that emerge characterizing the structural relaxation. And we are working a lot to try and quantify and understand better the time and temperature dependencies of all these uh, features. So one thing that we've done already is we've taken these time correlation functions, we've taken the Fourier transform and we've tried to compare the Fourier transform of the observed spectra in the simulations to the experimental observations I've just shown you in the slide before. So this is with the, with the symbols are the Fourier transform of the time correlation function measured in the simulations. So we start from high temperatures and we decrease the temperature. And this very last temperature has been uh, estimated carefully. It's close to the experimental gas transition. We looked at the frequency dependence of the spectra that we get. And we have very good strong evidence, which is uh, detailed in this uh, manuscript here, that this is really, this power really corresponds to the excess swing that the experimentalists have been describing uh, over the last 30 years from the, uh, the experiments. And so this paper is about trying to give and understand and give you a physical picture about the emergence of these SX excess swings in the relaxation spectra of supercool liquid. So I want to go to the final chapter in the last three minutes. I'm, I'm rushing a little bit the dynamics. So what are the interesting perspectives related to dynamics? I think there are many, and this is, I think, where the field is more open. And many questions, can one go faster, much closer to TG? Can we reach 100 seconds in the simulation? That would be really great. And, and this is really exciting. Can we do and observe and quantify these low dynamics in higher dimensions, try and see how we reach this uh, mean field limit, maybe? You've seen, I haven't seen much from the pictures because I didn't have time, but we saw something related to dynamic facilitation emerging in the images. I've told you about these length and time and these geometries of dynamic heterogeneities. Everything remains to be done in this new temperature regime that we can now access. And of course, the key question that is absolutely not answered uh, at the moment is, I had this chapter about thermodynamics. I just had this chapter about dynamics without linking the two. So I think the key important question in the field that I would like to address in the next few years would be, can we link you know, these thermodynamic fluctuations that are so solidly observed to these interesting dynamic observations that I've just shown you. So I want to say a few words about this final chapter before jumping to uh, the conclusion. So I've told you about thermodynamics and dynamics in the liquid. I want to say a few words about excitations in the glass and physics of the glass. And again, because now we can prepare these uh, extremely low uh, temperature configurations using the swap Monte Carlo, there are many types of questions that people have been asking over the last few years related to um, excitations in glasses. First type of excitations, you take your glassy configurations to t equals to zero, you look at the density of states. Interesting features have been observed. So sometimes uh, uh, in, in addition to sound waves, some, something like quasi-localized modes, and it turns out that going to lower and lower temperatures make these quasi-localized modes uh, change and evolve in an interesting manner. So in the context of um, this mean field theory I told you about, something like a new phase of uh, glaciers has been predicted. And again, quite a lot of studies have been spent to understand better the physics of these uh, Garner phases. A third chapter that has been, again, benefited a lot from this uh, swap Monte Carlo is plasticity of glasses. You take your glasses at low temperature and you try and deform them. So you apply uh, mechanical deformations to your systems. How does the system respond? How does it flow? How does it break? And again, uh, because we can now prepare glasses with different levels of uh, stability, the mechanical properties are changing in an interesting uh, manner. Fourth chapter that I wanted to uh, explain, but I won't have time, is what's happening when you go to extremely low temperature in glassy systems. And I was, uh, I wanted to tell you a story about the specific heat of uh, low temperature glasses. It's 
controlled by a different type of excitations that is called two level systems. And recently we have done an effort to try and observe and quantify two level systems in different types of glasses. And we've found again that depending on how deeply your system is prepared, the amount of two level systems that you find is uh, strongly dependent on the stability of your glasses. So overall, the chapter I wanted to describe is about um, simulation of the glassy state. Different types of excitations have been observed in different types of conditions, mechanical properties, harmonic properties, nonlinear properties, very low temperature properties. It seems that depending on how stable your glasses are, this, the number of these excitations is changing dramatically. And this is not well understood yet. And there is a whole a bunch of new studies to be performed here. So my final uh, slide, Ignacio, even broader perspectives and wrap up. So what are the big next questions that I think would benefit from better simulations? So can we get closer to the Kaussmann transition for which we have now a good hint of an existence? Can we find better algorithms to really see it directly? Uh, related to the dynamics, I think faster, newer algorithms would be uh, useful to go to even a longer time scale to get closer to what experiment uh, can do. I haven't said anything, but uh, you had in the SICAM workshop last summer, there is a large, exciting activity being uh, related to machine learning as applied to glasses. Many different types of questions are being asked using machine learning uh, techniques. And many people in this area are doing exciting uh, new results. I mean, there is a paper every week that was won uh, this week by the Laura Fillion uh, group. I haven't said anything, but it's an exciting uh, new area. And I hope this new area is going to uh, um, have consequences for dynamics and thermodynamic studies of the glass transition. And I have listed again these properties of the glassy states that are really interesting and difficult. And again, where computer simulations are making a difference, I think. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Ludovic, uh, for this uh, very thorough and uh, really interesting description and perspective on, on how, where we are and, and how the field will evolve. Um, I remember all uh, the participants that you can indicate your interest. Now we enter in the open uh, Q&A session. Everybody can ask a question. You don't need to write the question. It's enough that you indicate you will, your, your, your interest, and then you will receive the request to unmute yourselves, and then you can ask the question directly uh, to Ludovic. I think this will make the discussion more lively. Um, th there was actually one question that was made during your presentation that I left because it was a bit more methodological. So maybe we can allow, fortunately, the, 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 uh, there is no name associated to the IDs as 2216264. I don't know if you want to ask the question live. Um, otherwise, I will have Hi. this. Yeah. Hi. Hi, nice yes, to meet you. It's, it's Xenia. Yeah. I'm sorry, that is a UNN number. Uh, I just wanted to ask about the implementation of this method in LAMPS. So yes. is it actually possible to use like a fixed command or something like that? Or... <laughs> um, so yeah, so what, what I said is we, the reason, I mean, okay. One thing that we've done is we've tried to uh, combine the pure Monte Carlo thing with uh, MD. So the, the way it works now is we do MD simulations to, to, to make translational displacements of the particle. And from time to time, we stop and we do swap Monte Carlo modes. So of course, you, we did first that uh, implementation with the uh, house made code. And uh, several people in my group, in, um, in particular, Chris Fullerton and Elijah Flenner and Camille Kelly have worked hard to try and implement this into LAMPS. Uh, so it works. So the answer is, yeah, it works, but it requires a little bit of uh, fine tuning, which, which means, I mean, we could share these LAMPS uh, fix uh, with you and you could use it. 
it's not yet uh, totally uh, user friendly and open, but we can send it to you and explain and uh, many people have used it uh, already, but it's not totally straightforward. <laughs> it would be wonderful. Also, um, do you think this approach is feasible for simulating um, glassy polymers? <laughs> because, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's the like next. Uh, yeah, so I, I've, I've listed that uh, polymer glass question in the, my perspective. And, and the truth is, um, I'm, I'm trying to have a PhD student starting in September to precisely achieve uh, this. So I think it can, otherwise I wouldn't uh, hire a student. Uh, I'm not sure it's totally straightforward. And I have no idea how good and how well it's going to work to the point that when I asked uh, the polymer industry to give me the money, they say, no, we need a proof of concept first. So, so that's what the uh, student will do. And I hope the answer will be yes. I hope so too. <laughs> that would definitely help. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Now there is another question by Vishnu Krishnan. So Vishnu, do you want to ask it? Hi, yeah. Uh, so I was wondering if it's possible to reach even lower temperatures by uh, swapping clusters of particles instead of just uh, pairs of particles. And uh, if so, uh, just like um, uh, a binary system is facilitated by adding ternary or in-between sized particles, is it possible to facilitate swaps of clusters? Uh, could be. Uh, nobody has tried as far as I know. I mean, <clears throat> as I said, because swapping individual particle works, then uh, of course, your question is very natural. Why not try to invent a better cluster move, say? I mean, the question is, okay, which one do you try? How well does it work? How, you know, uh, how does this facilitate the dynamics? It's really your imagination. I mean, uh, you I can see. invent uh, hundreds of different Monte Carlo moves. Which one is going to work is not uh, easy uh -huh. to uh, decide. I mean, it, it see, I mean, it took so many years to realize that the swap moves were to be made extremely efficient. Uh -huh. So the idea was in the air, but in a sense, it, it was a bit surprising that it worked uh, so efficiently, I think, for a number of people. And so, so maybe cluster moves will work. I don't know. You try it and you tell me. <laughs> okay, yeah. Okay, okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Then it's another one by KJ Cho. Hello. Hi. Can you hear Hi. me okay? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The question is that uh, uh, yes, I'm not going to ask about crystal, but uh, uh, when you do say liquid, the, the liquid, the melting and then cooling down of most ceramic, they just crystallize. But when you grow them using the vapor phase deposition, you grow them in amorphous phase. So those amorphous phase oxide, ceramics, ceram and ceramics crystal materials have practical importance in a lot of device applications. So how one can describe this uh, vapor phase deposited amorphous materials within your framework? This mm -hmm. is important class of emerging technology material, but uh, I'm not sure how one can extend your approach to such class of materials. Well, okay, so I, interesting question first. I mean, it, it's a bit complicated. You're right, I mean, the, uh, the description I've made makes sense if uh, you can, you know, talk about changing parameters. So you're telling me I prepare a system and that's it. I cannot do a change to temperature because the system is going to crystallize. And then how does it fake into a phase diagram if I cannot uh, explore it? it? It's an interesting, complicated question. So, so regarding, I mean, vapor deposition itself, I mean, you probably know that, I mean, uh, in our group in, in Montpellier and in the uh, community, there has been this development in the last 15 years of, uh, due to the uh, discovery of Marc Edgar that uh, using vapor deposition, he could prepare 
uh, organic liquid with uh, extremely large stability. So you could ask the same question for his vapor deposited organic glasses, but he's done the work that you are saying. So how do they connect to the other types of liquid cold glasses that you know? And he's been able to show that his vapor deposited glasses were uh, behaving very much as liquid cold glasses that have been that have been uh, cooled over with um, a larger a sl sorry a slower cooling rate. So 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 for the systems for which crystallization can be relatively easily avoided, the relation between vapor deposited glasses and ordinary liquid gold glasses, and then all the concepts that I've described today have been. Uh, it's been possible for the systems for which as soon as they move they crystallize then i would just call them uh, you know um, bad glass formers and then if i try to do simulations of those they are crystallized so so i, I don't study them okay thank you okay. okay thank you very much so we have now a question uh, by peter solish on uh, mean field dynamics so peter Ludovic, you said um, very nicely that mean field, we now have a sort of canonical equilibrium mean field theory of glasses. How optimistic are you that there will be a canonical mean field theory for the dynamics soon? Well, uh, uh, well, you know, just, just as well as I do, Peter, I mean, the mean field dynamics is not the problem itself. I mean, it exists. It's, it's been around forever, just that it's plain wrong, as you know. So, so, I mean, the question is, can we have an extension of this to account for these uh, activated processes and to have a divergence of TK from, uh, uh, say, first principles? And I think I'm not optimistic on that second part. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, I think that's maybe a, a good note to finish this uh, Q&A about <laughs> what can, we should expect and what is a real challenge <laughs> ahead of us. So um, thank you very much, uh, Ludovic, for, for this uh, yeah. very tightful presentation. And uh, I re remember that those who register, will, we will have the second part in the gather room with the posters. And I hope Ludovic will be around as well as the rest of the uh, attendees so you also have the chance to have more informal follow-up discussions if you want. Now uh, at this stage we will then move on to the uh, second presentation of this first part which will be delivered by Grace Summers from uh, Princeton University. So Grace now floor is yours. So, okay. yes. All right, um, I guess I'll begin then. Um, yes. Thank yeah. you everyone for, for coming. Um, I'm going to be giving a presentation on research on uh, a spin analog to uh, systems of hard spheres or hard disks. Um, this is based on work that we published last year. This myself and collaborators at a, uh, both at Princeton and Max Planck Institute for the Physics of Complex Systems. And so without further ado, I will get started with some motivation. So um, as we all know, Poising models on a lattice allows for both simplifications and exact statements um, that we can make. So an example of this would be uh, both liquid gas transition. Um, one can study uh, a lattice gas, uh, which um, then has an exact mapping onto the Ising model. Um, another example would be studying random impurities in a metal and, and putting that onto a lattice in the form of a spin glass. And as we know, based on recent Nobel prizes, that, that's a, been a very fruitful direction of, of research as well. Um, but my focus today will be on, on the phenomena of jamming and glassiness. Um, and in particular, a prototypical model for studying jamming uh, would be packings of hard spheres. And as a, as a lattice analog to that, we'll be considering a hardcore spin model. Uh, so to be a bit more explicit about what I mean by this, this lattice analog, um, here at the left, I've shown 
of packing of hard spheres um, in a disordered configuration. And so being hard spheres means that uh, they are forbidden to overlap and they can be parameterized by their packing fraction as well as um, the, the radius of the spheres. And so those have translational degrees of freedom which we will be replacing with the orientational degrees of freedom of spins on a lattice. So here I've shown um, uh, a square lattice uh, with x, y spins where the red uh, shading indicates the, the orientations that are forbidden by their neighbors according to this exclusion constraint, which I will uh, define shortly. So, uh, full disclosure in this talk, I will actually mostly be focusing on equilibrium properties of this class of hardcore spin model. So um, I will try to make some contact with the ideas of, of jamming dynamics, um, but I will mostly be focusing on the, the statistical mechanics of this model, uh, which is interesting in its own right. Um, so one of the, so here below I've shown a schematic of the phase diagram on the square lattice. And um, this is actually, quite general. Um, so we have a maximum exclusion angle, which you can think of as being sort of analogous to, uh, you know, the packing fraction for say FCC uh, um, crystal. Um, and then below that, uh, there'll be this angle delta J. Uh, J is suggestively named for, for jamming, um, although I will mostly leave that mysterious. Uh, and encourage you to ask questions if you wanna know more about that. Um, but for the purposes of the equilibrium properties, this will be defined as having a continuously vanishing defect density as we approach this exclusion angle from below. And then below this angle where defects are going to be uh, allowed, they will still be irrelevant. And in fact, we will have a uh, quasi long range order by disorder uh, by by this phrase, I mean uh, that the, the quasi long range order is driven by entropy um, as opposed to energy because uh, we, we have a hardcore potential. Um, and then this region will terminate at this angle delta KT where there will be a costerless thalamus phase transition mediated by the unbinding of vortex anti vortex pairs. So now to actually give the details on this actual model, how it's defined. Uh, Quite generally, we're dealing with M component spins um, of a fixed length, uh, but we'll be, we'll be specializing to M equals two, so X, Y spins, and we'll be working on two dimensional lattices. So um, as we learned from the previous talk, you know, a lot of progress has been made on, on glass transition in mean field theory and the D equals infinity limits. So obviously this is, this is just two dimensions, so um, a much different, uh, a limit, and so we're we're but we're still able to do exact things because of this simplified spin model. Uh, so the hardcore constraint is simply that nearest neighbor spins uh, must enclose an angle greater than or equal to delta. Uh, so I've shown here on the square lattice, which will be the focus of this talk, um, these two, for instance, these two lower spins. Um, if if delta is given by this angle here, then the angle actually subtended by these two spins is this phi ij, uh, which is exceeds delta, and therefore that is an allowed configuration. Um, so for the square lattice, we can immediately deduce what is our so-called crystal, um, which is just an antifair magnet. So we split into a and b sublattices and um, rotate by pi between the two sublattices, and therefore that means that our maximum exclusion angle in this case is just going to be pi. Um, so we've identified one point on our phase diagram. Uh, we declare success in that regard. Uh, now time to attack the rest of the phase diagram. Um, so so I, uh, I tease this point, this delta J, and that, so now I wanna give a little bit more detail on, on uh, why, why do vortices become forbidden at this angle? And indeed, what is this angle? So here at left, I've shown um, uh, a vortex core on the square lattice and I'm zooming in on this core and I show it for an exclusion angle of pi over two. And you can see that it has no wiggle room. So this configuration is allowed on this plaquette, but if I were to try to um, move it by any little amount, it would become forbidden. Um, 
indeed, this would pose great problems for uh, local dynamics if I was trying to equilib equilibrate the system. Um, uh, and to see why I'm calling this a vortex, um, consider that since the square lattice is bipartite, we can map onto an equivalent inclusion model. Uh, to do this, we take the angle delta and we, so the exclusion angle delta will be mapped to pi minus delta, and we'll take all the spins on the B sub lattice and rotate them by pi. And then we will get an allowed configuration of an inclusion model uh, where uh, the inclusion model is defined by nearest neighbors must enclose an angle less than or equal to delta. And so here you can see that this vortex core is transformed into very clearly just a, a vortex in the um, in the in the inclusion model where nearest neighbors enclose an angle of pi over two. And it's so in order to have a winding of pi over two, or sorry, in order to have a winding of two pi, um, the minimal way to do this would be uh, to have each nearest neighbor go by pi over two, which will become forbidden uh, below that angle. Um, so having seen that vortices will be strictly forbidden above this angle, we can then ask um, about sort of a local order parameter for probing this defect density. And so we can see here again, I show in the inclusion model um, at an angle slightly above pi over two, uh, we have a little bit of wiggle room as I, as I decrease the inclusion angle or equivalently increase the exclusion angle, I slowly lose that wiggle room until I have none left. And concomitantly with that, uh, we can look at the, the density of defects just by adding up the vorticity on each plaquette. And uh, through, um, and we can, we can measure this in Monte Carlo simulations, which I'll describe a little bit more in the next slide. Um, and we find that this vanishes continuously as we approach delta J from below. Um, so just a little teaser on what this means for the dynamics, we actually find that there is a, a diverging time scale for uh, the dynamics as we approach delta J uh, for local dynamics. And indeed, this is mediated by um, uh, a diffusion annihilation process with the power law divergence in the, um, the time scale. So fingers crossed that this animation works. Um, so now I want to turn to the quasi long range order by disorder regime. So I, I should emphasize that on the previous slide, um, I was showing just the, the density of vort vortices on a microscopic scale. But um, as we allow vortices, they will still be uh, bound. And therefore on a coarse grained level, they, we won't actually see them. And if the, as long as they're irrelevant, we will still have this uh, power law decay of correlations. And so we can probe this using Monte Carlo simulations with a generalization of the Wolf cluster algorithm. Uh, and so actually I'm gonna try to show this. Uh, so here just at right, what I'm showing is what the red spins are the ones that get uh, re reflected in each uh, subsequent move. And so you can see sometimes the, the spins that get changed are a very large cluster and other times uh, they're small clusters. And indeed, um, although I've not shown it here, the average size of these, these clusters that get reflected um, actually scales with the same exponent as the magnetic susceptibility, which I've plotted here at the left. Um, and so this actually has pretty deep connections to a random cluster model um, and which is why this this uh, this algorithm is uh, sort of in a sense optimal for for bipartite lattices. And so again, so I've shown here at left um, the the finite size scaling of the Wolf. Um, sorry, the finite size scaling of the susceptibility, and both uh, in the region where vortices are strictly forbidden, as well as where um, they are irrelevant, we get a uh, on a on a log log plot, we get a, a linear scaling indicative of this, this power law decay of correlations. So, uh, so the, 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 the finite size scaling tells us about this exponent eta, the anomalous exponent for the power law decay. And what we find actually is that eta follows a very simple uh, trend. It just scales as the square of pi minus delta. 
And so I've shown this power law fit here, both deep in the deep in the quasi long range ordered phase, as well as once we allow vortices. Um, we don't actually detect any change in the correlations as we pass through that point delta J. So although it's detectable in the local dynamics and as well as in the equilibrium uh, defect density, from the perspective of the spin-spin correlation function, there's no change. And what this means actually is that we sort of recover universality in the sense that um, the true transition in the quasi long range order is just mediated by um, vortex unbinding and is just a costless thallus transition. So eta is a quarter at the uh, transition. So with that, I think I will um, just summarize uh, the, what the whirlwind tour I've given you of this model. So this is a constraint only model and by virtue of being a constraint only model with just a hardcore uh, interaction, it displays several interesting details, among them the vortex free spin wave regime, which I introduced, uh, as well as um, an entropically driven phase transition down at this angle, uh, which now I'm showing is around 0.435 pi, as well as in the dynamics. So the the way to study the equilibrium phase diagram was through this cluster algorithm, which as you could see in that small animation, sometimes involves highly non-local moves. But if we restrict to local dynamics, we find that we get um, uh, a slowdown as we approach delta J uh, that is um, easily explain explained by, vir by virtue of these defects. Uh, and I think what I'll close with is sort of maybe um, just a general point that uh, despite all these unique features, these these models also develop or also provide a striking example of universality in the sense that um, this the, ultimately the transition is the same as you would get in just a finite temperature x y nearest neighbor x y model. Um, and so, in that sense, despite having these these hard constraints um, at a microscopic level, when you when you coarse grain things uh, and the dust settles, we just end up with uh, perhaps exactly what we would have expected uh, for such, just based on the grounds of symmetry. Um, and so with that, I'll thank you for listening and uh, as well as thanking my collaborators and also encourage you to check out both my poster as well as uh, my, my collaborator, Benedict, um, his poster on more of the dynamics side of this model. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Grace. As I uh, re remind you that you can post questions or indicate you want to ask a question uh, through the Q&A, and then we will open the, the mic for you so that you can pose the question. Um, so while, while we wait, then I, I mean, maybe as, as you said, it's, uh, it's interesting to visit uh, Benedict's poster, but, I, I, but then, so how, how much do you think then the dynamics associated to this type of models is, uh, or can recover part of this glassy type behavior? In, oh. um, so, so to be honest, um, I'm not sure how much because at least what we've seen so far is that uh, rather than having sort of an exponential divergence in the in the relaxation time scale, it's, it's only a power law. Um, so in that sense, it's quite different from what you would see in, in the glass transition. Um, however, uh, right, th this is th that is what is what we're observing with the dynamics that we've looked at. Um, there's possibilities that with a different sort of, with some adjustments of this model, maybe we could recover something that looked more truly uh, glassy. Um, but I do not pretend that uh, this is a real uh, glass. Um, it's just more a, an interesting way to to study both the um, as both the glass formation as well as a sort of jamming in general. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Then there is a question by Vishnu Krishnan, so you can pose the question yourself. Um, so I think he asked, uh, how do you initialize systems with large deltas? Yes. Uh, so, Sorry. So, yeah. Uh, ah. yeah, yeah. Um, yeah uh, so you talked about how uh, crystalline systems were uh, the only possible state for a delta of pi. Um, but I'm guessing that even for other uh, 
um, deltas between pi by two and pi, it would be pretty hard to close if you started from random configurations. Is that? Yeah. So in fact, if you uh, so this actually relates um, to the topic of like inherent structures. If you were to just start with a random configuration. Uh, which will violate the hard constraint, and then just try to do gradient descent to find an allowed configuration. Uh -huh. uh, what you will find is that above pi over two, you will generally fail because your random initial configuration will have had some vortices, and thus when you try to essentially cool it uh, down to um, to find an allowed configuration, you'll have these uh, these vortices stuck there, and you'll always say this is not an allowed configuration. So um, from the perspective of actually just looking at the equilibrium uh, uh, statistical mechanics, what we do is I what I mostly do is just start in a a nail state, um, so start in the antiferromagnetic state, and ah. then give it some time to equilibrate, uh, and then start recording um, for the purposes of the looking at the susceptibility and stuff. And the important thing is that um, the the cluster algorithm that we use is actually provably ergodic. Um, on a bipartite lattice. So you can actually prove that from any initial configuration, you could, with with less than or equal to uh, the number of spins in the lattice, you could get to any other configuration. Uh, so it's able to unwind vortices as well as spawn vortex and anti-vortex pairs. So even if I start an ordered configuration, um, if vortices are allowed, I, I'm able to, can get uh, to just sort of spawn them into, into existence, um, yeah. I see. So there aren't any other um, nice minima that aren't inaccessible from the crystalline state, is what you're saying. Um, so, sorry, could you repeat that question? Um, so the, the crystalline state is a, is a nice place to start from, where from you can begin to wiggle. Uh, yes. So the statement you made was that there aren't any other such states, which aren't crystalline, from where you could begin to wiggle as well at other deltas. Um, yes, I mean, I guess the the point is like uh, eventually, if you if we were to run this algorithm, you could find such states. But like out of thin air, I can't think of one. Like I can't just really okay. write one down and think to myself like, oh, this is a disordered configuration that also uh, okay. could be allowed at high delta. Um, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. I have a, another curiosity. You you talk about this delta J like jamming, but then most of what you have been describing in the phase transition, the, the phase behavior has been mostly by analogy with this, I mean, the the, the costly thoughtless type of scenario. So the the name jamming is related to there that there is a, a transition you can map into what we know from jamming transition in other systems. Um. So yes, the point is that uh, at delta j is where all the interesting things happen in the local dynamics so for instance if you look at the mobility of a pair of vortex anti a pair if you start with a pair of a vortex and anti-vortex and you look at their mobility then as you approach pi over two this will go to zero as a power law you can also look at the um the decay of the structure factor or the um the density of or you can also just look at the time scale for equilibrating. Um, so within the local dynamics, and this is actually quite general uh, what kind of local dynamics you use, within the local dynamics, you'll see a diverging time scale there. Also, if you compress starting from a zero exclusion angle and you sort of apply the same method that you would use for hard spheres where you start with points and then grow them and uh, collide them along the way, then what you find is that if you have a fast enough compression, then um, you'll arrive at delta J with a finite density of vortices because you fell out of equilibrium. And therefore, once you get to delta J, you will not be able to compress further because you can't um, get past those vortices. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I do not see any additional questions. so. Well, thank you very much, Grace, again. I re remind everybody that Grace will also be in the gather room with the poster. And then there is this other poster by Patrick on the dynamics of this type of system. So you're welcome also to, to visit them. So we will then move to the last presentation of this first part of today's uh, uh, next gen event. Uh, so this will be presentation by Cheng Ye Luo from the Eindhoven University of Technology.
So Jenge, welcome. Now the floor is yours. Yeah. Hi, good afternoon or good morning, good evening, everyone. I'm Chen Jie Luo from Antong University of, Te Te uh, of Technology. The topic of my talk is many body correlations are now negligible in simple glass formats. This work was done together with Dr. Joshua Robinson, Professor Patrick Lawyer, and my supervisor, Elizabeth Youngson. We all know that when we cool a liquid slowly, we can get a crystal. However, if we cool the liquid fast enough, the crystallization can be avoided. The liquid will change it to an amorphous solid state, the glass state. This liquid glass transition is ubiquitous in many materials at different length scales, as uh, Ludwig have told us. Um, so from atoms at nanometers, colors at micrometers, to foams and granules at uh, millimeters. The glass-like behavior can also be observed in living cells and tissues. However, this ubiquitous glass transition is still one of the unsolved problems in physics. Why? When we look at the microstructure of liquid and glass, they are very similar. Both are disordered. However, the dynamics are very different. For liquid, each particle move fast, can easily go to other places far away. For glass, the particles cannot jump to other places because it is constrained by the cage produced by its neighbors. So the dynamics becomes tremendously slower. One of the key questions of glass transition is how to predict the very different dynamics from the very similar structures. Before we answer this question, we first need to know which quantities we need to characterize the structure and the dynamics. Recently, more and more evidence give us hints of the importance of many body correlations. For structures, two body correlations are usually sufficient to describe the main structure features, but they are not enough for some cases. Three body correlations could be vital, such as uh, Koslovich find, uh, find a blood and positive peak as small wave vectors and angles. Later, Zhang and Korb found that four body correlations revealed that the local three dimensional arrangement of the particles is highly anisotropic and show a simple symmetry. And moreover, locally favored structures are important and essentially there are many bodies. Now for dynamics, the dynamical two point correlation is regarded as an order parameter of glass transition. And four body correlations reflect dynamical heterogeneity, providing a dynamical length scale. The results of third and fifth order susceptibility support for theories based on thermodynamics. All these tell us many body correlations are vital for supercooled liquid and glass transition. So we will ask, can we develop a first principles theory that captures these many body correlations and predict the dynamics from the structures? The mode coupling theory is a well-known first principles theory that predicts the intermediate scattering function from the static structure factors. The inputs and outputs are two body, two point density correlation functions. This theory works very well, but with some uh, approximations. One is the Gaussian approximation that approximates the four point correlation by the product of two two point density correlations. Um, naturally, we can avoid this approximation and take the four point correlation as an output. And that is, we develop the equation of motion for the four point density correlations. But in it, the information of six point correlations is needed. As before, we can move the six point correlation to the output 
but then eight point correlations are needed. In this way, many body correlations will get a hierarchy of many body correlations. And this is a theory called generalized mode carbon theory, first developed by Professor Zemo. And the output has many body correlations and the input is only the two body uh, correlations. However, other approximations also exist. For example, the convolution approximation for the static three point density correlations. We can also avoid this by using the three point correlation as input. In fact, higher orders will also naturally appear and contribute to the theory. Therefore, we have a theory that connects the dynamic many body correlations and the static many body correlations. In principle, the level M and N should go to infinity to provide an accurate prediction of dynamics from structures. But here we will only focus on the first few levels, M equals to two and three, and N equals to two, three, four, because of the limitation of computer power. We want to show how the higher orders affect the glass transition. As we truncate it at finite level M and N, we will use the Gaussian approximation for higher levels when needed in the theory. Okay, now we apply our theory to a very simple but widely used model, the binary heart sphere mixture. Uh, there are two species, particle A and particle B with different diameters, dA and dB. The potentials between the particles are just to make sure that there is no overlap of the particles. In this model, there are three control parameters, the total packing fraction um, and the size ratio between the small particles and the larger one. And the number concentration of the small particles defined as the ratio of the number of small particles and the total particle number. The Lawson field fundamental measure theory provides relatively accurate structure of this model. So we use S2 and S3 formats as input for GMCT and then append the dynamics. We decide it is a liquid or a glass from the long time limit of the dynamics. Now let's see how the glass uh, transition diagrams predicted from standard MCT, that is M equals two and N equals two. The X axis is the number concentration of small particles and the Y axis is the packing fraction. For hot spheres, the system is liquid at low packing fraction and become glass at high packing fraction. So the lower part is liquid state and the upper part is glass state. Different curves uh, represent uh, liquid glass transition curves at different size ratios. The bottom line corresponds to a small size disparity with a size ratio delta equals to 0 0.8. Uh, the top line corresponds to a large size disparity. Okay, and for monodispers, MCG predicts a critical packing fraction uh, equals to 0 0.516. We find at a large size disparity, delta equals to 0 0.5, the mixing leads to a higher critical packing fraction. This is the entropy driven plasticization effect. However, at a small size disparity, the critical packing fraction is smaller than the monodispersed case. This is the inverse plasticization effect. And both effects have been observed in simulations. Now let's see how the dynamical higher order correlations affect these transition curves. We can see as the level N increases, the critical packing fraction increases. So effectively stabilizing the liquid state. This was already discovered for monodispersed hard spheres. So this is a big success of GMCT because as the level N increases, the critical packing fraction is closer to the experimental glass transition point. 
Now let's look at the curves at different size regions. For small size visibility, the inverse plasticization effect does not change much as the level n increases. However, for large size disparities, the plasticization effect is inverted. This means increasing the dynamical level n qualitatively change the glass transition curves. Now, what about increasing the static level m? When level n equals to two, increasing m uh, will lead to lower packing fractions. So adding static chip lead correlations stabilize the glass state. Furthermore, we find that for all level n, adding static chip lead correlations always decrease the critical packing fraction. If we check carefully, for the shape of the curve, we can see at level n equals to two, for small size disparity, the inverse plasticization effect is inverted. But for large size disparity, the plasticization effect does not change. However, for higher level n levels, uh, higher n levels, the inverse plasticization effect is always inverted. So overall, both static level M and dynamic level N will qualitatively change the transition curves. Now let's compare to some simulation data. The green curves show the long time diffusion coefficient B at packing fraction phi equals to 0 0.57, close to the glass transition point. The larger D means the higher packing fraction needed to achieve a glass. So we can roughly regard these curves as glass transition curves. So compared with these results, we find MCT seems to perform best because both the plasticization effect at small size ratios and the inverse plasticization effect at large size ratios are observed in simulations. However, we can say GMCT performs better than MCT, at least for certain size ratios. First, uh, the critical packing fraction phi at higher level n are closer to the simulated values. So the simulation critical packing fraction is at least 0 0.58. Second, more accurate position, uh, location of the peak of D or the critical packing fraction um, can be observed. So for example, here, the peak of the position, the position of the peak D shifts to small number concentrations. And this can be observed for n equals to three and n equals to four. But for standard MCD, the position of the peak seems almost constant. So in this sense, we may say, a qualitatively good prediction from standard MCT are in fact a coincidence or a cancellation of errors. And many body correlations are non negligible. In sum, we further developed the first principle based theory GMCT such that many body correlations are included. And the theory is applicable for mixtures. And by numerically study of the binary Hausfeld mixture, we demonstrate that many body correlations are not negligible, including either static or dynamic higher order correlations will qualitatively change the glass transition curves. And we find that for hard spheres, static chip lead correlations effectively stabilize the glass state, while uh, dynamic higher order correlations destabilize it. Finally, I have some outlooks. First, uh, we want to add more accurate structures and go to higher levels to check the convergence because right now you can see the convergence is not so clear. Second, further improvement of the theory is needed, such as we uh, put the static level M and the dynamic level N on an equal footing and uh, we want to check and even remove the Gaussian approximation. And in our GMCD theory, the 
power law divergence of the relaxation time still can be predicted, but this is not consistent with simulation. So we hope to get rid of this. And maybe we can include activation process and also add both diagonal correlators that are neglected in the current framework. Uh, thank you for your attention. Okay, Chenjie, thank you very much for, for this uh, talk. And I remind again, everybody, you can simply indicate in the Q&A your interest in asking a question and then you are unmuted, so you will be able to ask the question yourself. So we have uh, one first question by Francesco Shortino. So please, Francesco. Yes, hi. hi. So a very nice uh, talk and uh, I'm really impressed by this uh, heroic study because uh, I know how difficult it is to go beyond the, the second order of Mokapin theory. But I have, I have a question for you. Did you try, I mean, I've seen that you've shown that you have improvement of uh, even worse uh, uh, predictions compared to the simulation data according to the size ratio. But we don't, still don't know if uh, this uh, comes from the input or comes from the theory. I mean, could it also well be that the input you use, uh, you cited the star zone approach, right? Uh, is, uh, it's related to the fact that this theory does not really properly cal calculate uh, this uh, higher, order higher order correlation function. Did you try to do the same with the simulation data for, for these quantities? Uh, yeah, this is a very good question. Actually, uh, we tried to do that but uh, the, the S3 or C3, you know, is hard to get accurate value from simulation. So um, let me show you some results for... Um, so here, so before we add in S3, uh, so increasing the dynamical level, we can see similar effect from the S2 from simulation. So this may be partially answer your question, but indeed, strictly speaking, we need to add S3 also from simulation to uh, make our, th uh, our conclusion more solid, right? Mm. That would be nice to know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but um, the main point here is so changing the S3 and uh, in increasing M and N, the shape become different, right? So um, simply saying we cannot ignore the many body correlations. So yeah. this is agree with your results uh, to 2001, I remember. So for silica, so the S3 also important. Yeah, so I think they are consistent. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Francesco. So we have uh, another question by Daniele Koslovic. So Daniele, you want to pose the question? Yeah, I think it's quite related. So uh, my curiosity was uh, exactly about the, um, the role of three body correlations. Um, so what Francesco and Walter Cobb showed long ago is that yeah, for silica, this makes a difference in terms of FCT predictions, but for a uh, fragile glass formers, they couldn't see basically any change. So right. uh, yeah, I was a bit curious about that. How can you uh, reconnect the two results? Uh, yeah, so here, I think uh, for different size ratio, uh, when the size ratio becomes, the delta becomes smaller, so the size disparity becomes larger. The effective uh, attraction between the uh, particles becomes larger. Mm -hmm. So this may be more like the silica case. That's why the behavior becomes more different. Yeah. That's okay, so it's model dependent, let's say. Um, yeah, I think so. Okay, cool, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I do not see any additional questions, so I think maybe it's a good uh, point to, to close this uh, Q&A and then
to thank the three speakers for, for their uh, insightful presentations. I, I hope you have enjoyed presentations and the discussion. And um, so let me just uh, so finish just by sharing. Oh, I don't know where I am. Yeah, no, I did this wrong. So oh, now it should be here. Sorry. Yep. So yeah, indeed. So I remind you that, as I mentioned, it, the this session will also be made available online in a few days, and you can check this session and all of them on our website. And now, for those uh, who have registered, we will move to the second part of today's sessions on on uh, gather. So if you stay for a minute, I will just give a couple of technical points uh, uh, for for this session. Thank mm -hmm. you.